Hello, I'm Georgiana Constantine Park. I'm a political science instructor and subject matter expert, a journalist and a researcher. We're going to start off the conversation today by talking about bioethics. And you might wonder, why would bioethics really concern anybody outside of the medical field, right? And is there any connection between what I said I did in political science and the field of bioethics? Yeah, the answer is complicated. So the most important thing is that, yes, there are connections between bioethics and everything or most things in our society. And the reason for that is that it actually affects the way that our society looks and behaves. It affects the way the med medical field works. And obviously, we're all interested in health. It affects the way that the legal system works. And of course, we're all interested in our legal field. And it affects a lot of other things. Um, it's important to have people, obviously, in the medical field, but also in the legal field and uh, philosophers and uh, political scientists and econ economists um, and really anybody who has some value to bring to the conversation that bioethics starts. And we're going to get into a few of the questions that it deals with so that we can underline the importance of why all of us should be interested in these conversations. Um, so first of all, bioethics, applied ethics in the field of medicine, whether we're talking about patient care or medical technology, um, deals with a lot of, of controversial things that we might catch a glimpse of on television or on, especially on the news, definitely on Facebook and social media. Um, the first and most important thing that a lot of people over here in the United States, at least, have to deal with um, in terms of these types of bioethical questions um, abortion. It's one of the things that has caused um, a lot of controversy. And the real reason for that is the definition of the person. So is a person um, something that, uh, or the, I guess personhood, something that you receive from the mon moment of conception? Or is it something that you receive during a period of gestation uh, when, when the woman's pregnant with her baby um, or is it something that uh, a child receives after they're born and if they do receive it after they're born then how soon after they're born because there have been conversations that have stressed perhaps the possibility of a post-birth abortion if one could call it that so this is something that is morally ethically um, legally significant. It's obviously one of the most important things that you receive with your title of personhood is the right to life, the acknowledgement of the right to life. So anybody killing you willingly would be guilty of murder because you are a person. If you're not a person, then that particular subject who has killed the other one is not guilty of murder. Something else that stirred a lot of controversy 40 years ago when the first IVF uh, baby was born was, of course, this, this um, in vitro fertilization process. Um, at the time, people were wondering, is this right? Should we do this? Is it moral? Is it safe? How should we look at a child born in this particular way, conceived in this particular way, um, as opposed to children conceived naturally? Of course, the person who was born from IVF for the first time 40 years ago is alive and well, and uh, she still talks about these issues uh, in the media. There, there has been some talk about uh, some potential underlying health issues with children born from IVF, but uh, there isn't enough research about it. That's another thing why this is important, because we, we need the research, we need the conversation, we need to know what it is that we're doing in the future and not just blindly go into um, things like that. Uh, of course, something else that centers around the definition of personhood, uh, embryo and stem cell research, where you have certain embryos um, left over from IVF and then other embryos created especially uh, for stem cell research. 
a lot of people will agree with res doing research on uh, the embryos that have been left over from IVF procedures because they say, well, the embryo is going to be destroyed anyway. And uh, since doing stem cell research on embryos, in fact, it does destroy the embryo in the end, then at least they have been given a purpose. Other people don't agree with that. So again, is a person a person from a conception? And if it is, what do we do with all the frozen embryo banks that we have? In, in the United States, there are a lot of embryos that are left over after IVF procedures. And Germany, I think, doesn't have any because it has regulations around things like that. Another important moral question. Um, something else was, for instance, the paternalistic attitude that a lot of doctors had in the past towards their patients. And they didn't think it was necessary for um, them to ask their patient's opinion because they thought that they knew they knew best and of course we get a lot of things perhaps a woman goes under for some sort of simple surgery and she ends up um, not you know waking up with her uterus being removed or something like that because uh, the doctor thought it best that after having five children she shouldn't have any more children or perhaps you had an underlying health condition that the doctor considered might have been safer if they did a hysterectomy no consent, no question. Traumatic. It may be tragic, maybe horrible. And uh, that particular person didn't get any say in it. This happened a lot, um, many years in the past. I mean, not that many, actually, quite recently. Doesn't happen now. And Lord forbid, if it does, it obviously ends up with um, legal action being brought against that particular doctor, as one should, of course. So. Now we have informed consent. Of course, you can ask questions. Uh, how informed is the consent? I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to understand exactly what they say. But of course, it's the responsibility of the medical professional to make sure that you understand the consequences of the plans that they're proposing for your treatment. So it's a better time we live in in respect to that. Uh, thank goodness for that. Um, and again, related to personhood, where we have the uh, American and the Nazi experiments with... Um, people who weren't considered persons or even if they were considered persons here in the United States, they were treated with a lot of paternalism and they doctors just thought that they knew best. There were a lot of horrible experiments where people were exposed to, um, to um, uh, tuberculosis, uh, to hepatitis, uh, to um, or either exposed to syphilis or just uh, told that they were getting treatment for syphilis, which was available at that time. But in fact, they were left to die so the doctors could actually study the course of the disease. So horrible, horrible things that happened. Of course, the Nazi experiments would... I don't even want to get into that. It was... So <laughs> the point is how important it is to see and to be lucid about where society is heading in terms of ethics and in terms of um, its laws and what it you can and cannot do. Now, where does this actually situate the conversation around disruptive innovation? Well, since we talked about all of these important questions, some of the important questions, because there are so many others out there, um, one particular tool that has recently been made available to um, the world is CRISPR-Cas9, which is an amazing technology um, the experts um, are trying to explain it as a uh, cut and paste tool for your DNA. There are a lot of things that people will pass on to their children, a lot of inherited diseases. And we know what genes are responsible for some of these. And since we know, and since we now have this amazing tool, uh, we can go in there, we can cut that gene out, and we can fix that person's problem. And that is amazing that is technology at its best it's disruptive innovation because it made gene editing and, and, and cutting into DNA like that um, a lot cheaper a lot easier a lot more accurate now, of course it's not perfect no system really is but it is a lot better than what we had before so it is in fact disruptive innovation and it is it is really truly wonderful and the applications for it are um, just amazing in the future. Um, the 
problems here uh, start to show themselves when we talk about how do we regulate this? Do we regulate it? And if not, how do we deal with the consequences? And what about intellectual property? Patenting it. To go back to the first set of questions, how do we regulate this? There have been a set of documentaries that I've been watching on this as well, uh, just not just doing research, but also watching what, what other people's research has, has brought out. And one of these documentaries, there was a person who was um, a biohacker, is what they call themselves. And he thought CRISPR was amazing. He used it on himself. He wanted it available to the public. He wanted everybody to really use this technology, make use of it, and, and um, go on and innovate further. But of course, he did say people needed to be informed before they started using the technology. And at the beginning of the documentary, he was very excited. He used it on himself. He would show people how simple it was. He had these kits that he would send out to people and all of these things. But at the end of the documentary, he wasn't so sure about really leaving it out there for people anymore. Because what he noticed was that a lot of people uh, were marketing it for something that it wasn't, some sort of a miracle something. Uh, a lot of people weren't really understanding what it was um, that they needed to do or be aware of with this technology. And there was a lot of abuse in this respect. And by the end of the documentary, the person was thinking to themselves, yeah, maybe we need some regulation around this because it doesn't seem like people can really be trusted to use this right. So that's what he was thinking. Now, there was a particular case, uh, a little boy of seven or eight, and he was going blind because of a defect in one of his genes, and they knew what gene it was, and um, he got a shot with, with this amazing technology, and he started to see again. Of course, the questions then show up where if this technology was patented, and if it cost $2 million, because you can do whatever you want with the price when it's your technology and it's your patent, uh, because you're the only option out there, then perhaps this little boy would never have gotten that. Uh, people dying of cancer would probably never uh, get to benefit from the applications of this. And, and maybe, maybe that patent would in fact stifle innovation. And it gets people thinking, and you want to think about it, because this is the future of, of society that, that you're really debating and, and thinking about. And there was a case that really speaks about what happens when there is in fact a monopoly and uh, the wrong thing is patented. And this case was um, a company in the United States decided to patent two particular genes um, that are responsible for breast cancer. And they did. They patented genes. The result of this was that their tests were incredibly expensive. They were the only one giving those tests on the market. And the most tragic part of all, their tests actually gave a, about 12% of the people tested a false negative because they hadn't updated their database um, with research on these particular genes that kept coming out. So 12% of the women who got tested for breast cancer, they got the results, they were negative. Awesome, great, I'm not a carrier of this gene, I'm not gonna get breast cancer. Several years later, they got breast cancer. The United States Supreme Court eventually got involved and um, thanks to this uh, organization that took them to court, apparently um, there was a lot of gene patenting going on and it had been going on for quite some time. Well, this organization decided that they had had enough and that this isn't normal. And they took this to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, in the end, after a long fight, that you can't patent nature and that Human genes, whether in the body or outside the body, are just nature sitting there, was one of, what one of, one of the judges said. Um, so, of course, this company lost its, its hold on these particular genes. And what happened afterwards was that a lot of companies came out with better tests, cheaper tests. Uh, women could now go out and get more than one opinion on their, uh, uh, on their tests. 
And all of a sudden this was available to the consumer like it hadn't been before. And wonderful things started happening for the consumer in this particular respect. So disruptive innovation is a wonderful thing because it makes things cheaper. It makes them simple. It makes them available to the public. Patents are important. Intellectual property is important because a lot of companies would never really invest in, in certain types of research if they knew that there's no money to be made in it. So a lot of innovation would stop, maybe not take place in the first place. But on the other side, some companies will have a monopoly if they have this particular patent on this particular thing that um, has great potential. Now there are a lot of universities out there who that are um, able to really run their research on just one or two patents. That's really what their income is. And that's, you know, that's, that's great that it keeps them up there. But also what about the consumer when, when one company has a monopoly and you get something like the case of, of the, the uh, patenting of the cancer genes, where it's really um, bad for the consumer to just have this one option that is not even that accurate. And of course, the patenting of genes. Really? So perhaps the question is, uh, or revolves around the, the fact that we need to be very careful of what it is that we patent, first of all. And to not fall into extremes, this should be completely unregulated and free for all, all the time, or this should be with one company, with one patent, there should be a monopoly, that's the company's right, and that's all that there is to it. There's something in the middle. There's no perfect system, there's no perfect person, there's no perfect anything. But the closest we can come to perfection, I think, is having conversations, engaging with one another, and really deciding somewhere in the middle there's a balance that we can reach. They can be good for us as individuals and good for society. So future generations, this generation, we have to have these conversations about bioethics, about disruptive innovation and its importance, and about intellectual property and its importance and its limits, if you believe that there are any. We need to come together. We need to put our brains together. And we need to create a future that is a good future, or as much as we can make it good. Because there's always a balance. There's always a middle ground. There's always something that we can do that doesn't throw us into extremes, and it doesn't hurt us as individuals or society in general as much. Thank you.